Hello, everyone. It's nice to be here. It's an honor to speak to you today. I have some patients here in the audience, the audience that I recognize. Um, wanted to give you one little caveat. This is kind of a long talk, and I was instructed by my boss not to bore you, because if I do, then when he comes and speaks, she'll be sleeping. So I'm going to go fast. I'm going to try to keep it upbeat and peppy. Plus, I have a habit of talking a little too quickly. Um, when I was a kid, my elementary school teacher told my folks that I don't talk constantly, I talk incessantly. So I'm going to talk incessantly now, and hopefully we're going to learn some things. I'm going to spend most of my time at the beginning just explaining to you how the eye works. We'll later get into macular degeneration, but right now we're just going to talk about the eye. This slide has been up here for a long time, so basically, the problem is we got a little tiny organ with a lot of things that can go wrong. And how do you start? What do you do? There's different kinds of doctors for different kind of issues. The first is an optometrist. Just so you know, these are not medical doctors, but they are doctors of optometry. They have an OD after their name instead of an MD. They go to school for four years of college and then four years of post-training. And they're um, generally looking at the eye from a standpoint of how do I get them to see well. Some of them are better at what they do than others. Some of them can recognize disease states. And when they do, they usually refer them to an ophthalmologist or to a specialist. So an ophthalmologist has a little extra training. After four years of college, they go to medical school for four years. Then they do a year of internship where they actually work in a hospital, do pediatrics, ER, obstetrics, all kinds of fun things, until they get accepted into a school where they do three years of residency training in ophthalmology. So it's a 12-year endeavor for them. These are medical doctors. They do perform general eye exams. Um, and they look for medical disease states. Some of them do surgeries. Some of them refer that out. But they're trying to find what can we do to help people see the best. Lastly are the specialists. They have that 12 years of training, like a general ophthalmologist, but then they add a year or two on. Um, they get fellowship trained, which means they go to a specific place where they work with some of the leaders in their fields of that specialty that they've chosen to go into. And when they come out, they have a specialty training. These are, again, medical doctors. There are ideas to do specific eye exams, not general eye exams, and then for look at disease states and see if they can do something about it. So I'm just going to talk briefly, well, maybe bigger than briefly, about how the eye works. Um, the easiest way to describe it is that it works like a camera, and luckily the age of the folks here in this room know what cameras are when you actually have to do things like move the lens and do the shutter correctly. Now the smartphones kids go like this and everything is done for you. But in the old days, the cameras worked like our eye does. The outside of the camera is like the cornea. That's the part of the eye that is clear. It protects things um, so that things don't fly in the eye and it covers the eye up. The pupil is actually a hole in the eye, and it's like the automatic flash on your camera. When you're in a very dimly lit area, your pupil gets large, so as much light can come in as possible. And the opposite is true when you're in a very bright area. The pupil will get small, so that your eye isn't flooded with too much light. The lens of the eye is like the lens of a camera. It moves to get focus. Light comes into the front of the eye, gets focused through the lens, shoots to the back of the eye, tells the brain what you're seeing. And the retina is like the film in the camera. So the image comes into the eye like it does into the camera, and it plants itself in the eye on the retina and in a camera on the film. Uh, real quickly, the inside of the eye is interesting because there's actually two compartments, uh, the front of the eye and the back of the eye. And they are held together with what we call vitreous. It's like a water balloon, but instead of water, it's this jelly, goopy stuff. Um, it actually holds the eye in the right position and it moves back and forth through the eye. It's made in the front, goes through a meshwork, kind of like a screen, goes through to the back, and comes back through the meshwork, and just keeps circulating over and over again, providing nutrients and oxygen to the eye. And at the very back of the eye is the nerve, and this is where the images are sent through an electrical type signal to the brain to tell you what you see. So, how does the eye work? Again, lights through the front of the eye, through the cornea, the pupil, the lens, go back through the vitreous, to the back of the eye, to the sensitive retina, and then the message goes to the brain. So that's what a normal eye is supposed to do. Here we see again that the light goes to the back of the eye where there's photoreceptor cells. These are the rods and cones that you've heard about. Rods are for black and white, cones are for color vision. So anything that disturbs that passage of light from the front of the eye to the back of the eye is going to cause a distortion in your vision or a change. 
Um, real quickly, just because um, there are people that might be familiar with some of these things, I just want to tell you, for example, with the cornea, that front surface, if it becomes damaged, usually through an accident, an acid burn, trauma, um, that can be removed and transplanted with another cornea. Many of you are donors, uh, organ donors, and this is what is used in this case. There's plenty of folks who were born with corneal problems or have had a traumatic injury, and uh, after your death, if you've do donated your eyes, they take that small sensitive cornea off and actually transplant it onto someone else's eye. It's a wonderful surgery that helps a lot of folks. If the light can't get to the back of the eye because the lens is causing a problem, we have to look at that. There's two problems that happen with the lens as we get older. The first one happens in your late 40s, early 50s, and that's when your arm can't get long enough for you to be able to focus on something. What happens with that is, unfortunately, the lens, which is normally very supple and moves very nicely, starts to get kind of old and tired, and it doesn't move the way it's supposed to. So instead of it focusing, it just sits there. So that's why you go to the grocery store or to the Marks and you buy all kinds of little plus twos, plus ones, plus three glasses. You have them all through your house and when you need one you can't find one. That's what happens when the lens changes as you get older. Even worse than that is when you get super old you get a cataract, right? They happen all the time. I have the beginning stages of it myself. When it gets bad enough, luckily we have a great thing we can do and that's called a cataract extraction. This has gone crazy in the last few years. When I started out of college, worked on a head and neck floor, they used to admit people for cataract surgery. You'd stay in for two or three days, you had sandbags next to your head and you couldn't bend over. That's because they used to make a big cut along the side of the eye, pull the cataract out, put a fake lens in and close you back up again. Now it takes about five minutes, they put a little tiny probe in there, it hits that lens, breaks it into a zillion pieces, sucks it out, and then they put a little lens in when it pops in and opens up in the eye. Very easy and very, very helpful. Um, you might have heard people say, I have a secondary cataract. What happens with that is this lens that the, is put in your eye, it's synthetic. Sometimes our bodies react to it poorly and say, you know, you're not supposed to be here. And when that happens, it gets a little bit cloudy and the cloudiness can cause problems. So the doctor will take you for a laser procedure, very quick, very painless, and they just basically blast all that cloudiness out of the lens. Vitreous diseases, um, what disturbs vision with this is, remember you got this jelly back there, and as we get older that jelly starts to shrink and shrivel up, and when it does that, unfortunately, little tiny pieces of the retina can break off and get stuck in the jelly, and these are called floaters, and I'm sure a lot of you have them. When you look at an object, you might see a little black dot, and as you move your eye, it moves with you. It's kind of your friend. Um, these happen uh, a lot as you age. Um, they're really pretty much benign. Nothing, nothing, nothing needs to be done about it, though it's um, very frustrating to have them sometimes. However, if you have flashes of light associated with these floaters, and if it happens very suddenly with lots of flashes and your floater gets larger and larger, or you feel like you have a curtain that's being pulled down on the eye, that's the sign of something more serious, like a retinal detachment. But the vitreous, if it's clear and works well, doesn't hamper your vision. If not, it can. The retinal diseases are my main focus today, and I'll skip that. And lastly, optic nerve disorders. Again, you can have the most beautiful, pristine eye, and if your nerve is damaged, the image getting to your brain is not gonna be correct. So, age-related macular degeneration. Uh, used to be called ARMD, now they just have, um, they got rid of the R, so it's just age-related MD, AMD. The retina is made of many layers that are sandwiched together. Um, it's between the vitreous and the back of the eye, and it consists of two major parts of the retina. One is the macula, and one is the peripheral retina. The macula is the tiniest little spot in the center of your eye that gives you the vision you need to read small print, to see people's faces. Um, some color vision is involved in this, and this is going to be our main focus today. But quickly I'll tell you that the peripheral retina is the rest of the retina. It goes all the way and wraps around to the front of the eye. Um, this gives you some vision. It's not detailed vision, but it, it's better than not having any vision. Basically, somebody comes alongside of you, you can see that they're standing there, but you might not recognize exactly who it is. But that's your peripheral vision from the peripheral retina. Okay, so what is AMD? Um, the layer of the retina called the RPE is the layer that's the closest to the back of the eye. And it can get disrupted by deposits of what we call drusen. They're little tiny yellow bumps in the road almost, as you will, 
that sit on the uh, lens, I mean, sorry, sit on the retina like they sit on the film of a camera and cause damage to it. Um, if it degenerates enough, you actually have pieces, parts missing of your vision. It's the leading cause of, of age loss in people at the age of over 65, and it's associated with aging. So what are the risk factors? If you're over 60, if you have a family member with it, we are learning so much that um, Dr. Singerman will speak about the Macula Risk Project. We're finding a lot of information that shows that this can be passed in families. Um, women are most likely to get it over men, usually fair hair, blonde, I'm sorry, fair eyed blonde women more than the opposite, but I can introduce you to a lot of men with dark eyes and dark hair that also have this problem. Um, anything that messes up your uh, cardiovascular system, smoking, uh, heart problems, blood pressure issues, can compromise the way that um, oxygen and nutrients are brought to the eye. So that doesn't help um, at all. Um, if you have a poor diet that doesn't have um, certain uh, vitamins in it or certain minerals, it can also contribute. And it is much more common in white than any other race. Oh, sunlight exposure too, I'm sorry. Um, that's key. They believe more and more that uh, protection of the eye with sunglasses is paramount in, in helping the eye not develop this. So the symptoms of AMD is a darker and empty center spot. As you can see on this picture, there's a clock up there, but the middle of the clock is missing, and you can see the edges, but you can't necessarily tell what time it is. Straight lines may look distorted. When you look at people's faces, you might see their ears, their, their top of their head, their chin, but you can't necessarily see their facial features. Um, some people have told me that they've looked outside and looked at a telephone pole and instead of it being straight, it's all wonky or it's dis disjointed. Those are signs that there's damage to the macula. How do we diagnose it? Ophthalmologist looks at you um, in the bright light with the headpiece on. Um, we do things called angiograms and also things called OCT. Trina is here and is going to explain OCTs to you. Angiograms are when you actually have a small amount of dye injected into your hand or to your arm, and it travels through your circulation, and we take pictures as the dye passes through. If there's damage and, and blood vessels are broken, that will actually show up on the pictures, and we'll be able to see exactly where the damage is. It is invasive. It takes 45 minutes or so to do the procedure. Um, the good news, again, is OCTs are not invasive, and they're quick. Um, we're using them more and more. Two types of AMD, the dry form and the wet form. Um, for years, people have said to me, you know, do I have the worst form? One of these is worse than the other, right? Uh, it used to be, yes, that wet AMD was the worst form, but now we have a bunch of treatments that we can offer, and if you can get treatment quickly enough, it does not devastate your vision the way it used to. Um, the dry form of the disease, unfortunately, we don't have treatment for, and the vision loss can be severe. So it doesn't, uh, that there's no really easy answer to the question, what is worse? Um, to be honest with you, the fact that we have treatments, I think, makes the dry one a little trickier, but we're getting there. Real quickly, the dry form of the disease is caused by aging and thinning of the macula. The loss is usually gradual, it can be severe or very mild. And again, it's those little tiny drews and those yellow dots I told you about in the back of the eye. They're little bumps. And if you get enough of them in a certain area, they can actually push on the retina and basically starve it of the oxygen and nutrients needed. And so all those little photoreceptors that are supposed to tell your brain what it sees can't work. It's the most form, form, uh, common form of the disease as well. So how do we treat it? Right now, we don't. Um, there's a lot of studies. I'm going to tell you about a few of them that we're doing. We're very, very hopeful that we're going to find the answer soon. There are vitamin supplements that some believe help, but they certainly are not a cure. Some of them are um, actually in concentrations that might cause symptoms in the rest of your body. So we wouldn't suggest you take these unless you ask the advice of a physician. And it was, I mentioned, we're doing, uh, we've had eights, but actually it's 10. I, last night I woke up in the middle of the night and thought, ooh, there's two more that I didn't mention. But we've done about 10 studies on dry macular degeneration. And I am going to tell you about the ones that we're doing now in just a, a few minutes. So we're going to go to the wet macular degeneration, which um, many of you might know about and have experience with. And this is caused when there's abnormal blood underneath the retina. Um, we have a wonderful chemical in our body called VEGF. It is a great thing that helps us heal. 
Um, it swims around the body, looks for trouble, and when trouble's there, it deposits new blood vessels um, to the area to feed it oxygen and nutrients. Uh, works great when you have a heart disease, for example. It helps build collateral circulation. Um, and with the eye, unfortunately, it's not quite as helpful, and we'll talk about why. Basically, your body, here's this message from your eye that I'm in trouble and I need help. So this VEGF swims to the area, and it starts depositing itself everywhere, and when it does that, new blood vessels start growing. Unfortunately, these vessels are very, very weak. They're usually um, very wrapped around each other, and the next thing you know, they break, and when they break, fluid and blood can um, come out and get under the eye, under the retina, and that's where macular degeneration is wet. Good news is there's treatment for this, and it all came from ideas from chemotherapy, actually. Um, the scientists were thinking that if um, people with tumors, um, there was a blood supply that led to feed the tumors, and if there's a way to cut that blood supply off, perhaps we could use it in the eye as well. So the drugs that we use actually try to stop this damage without, da without damaging the good, healthy part of the eye. This treatment has um, evolved very quickly. Back in 2001, the only thing we had to offer folks was a hot laser treatment. Works great, cauterizes those blood vessels, causes them to shrivel up and die, and the event usually stopped. But unfortunately, if you put a hot laser definitely in the center of the eye, you're going to lose vision. Um, so there wasn't much of an option. We still use hot lasers occasionally. If um, the damage is off to the side, we'll use it. Um, it leaves quite a scar, and you might have a little blind spot, but it should still pre preserve the center of your vision if needed. Then in 2001, PDT later came out. Kim was instrumental in, a, in the clinical de development of that in our office. This is a cool laser used with a drug, and when the drug gets activated by the cool laser, the blood vessels start to shrivel up and die. Um, one of my patients told me a great way to describe it, at least I think so. He was a World War II vet, and he said, it's kind of like if you have an airfield and a bunch of bad guys are underneath, underneath the airfield and you want to kill them. If you drop a bomb on the air airfield, you're going to kill them all, but you're not going to have an airfield left. But if you put little tiny grenades in all their tunnels underneath, the grenades will blow up, you'll kill all the bad guys, and there's still going to be some airfield left. That's the difference between hot and cold laser. The cold laser doesn't damage the good tissue. Um, the vitamin studies have shown that um, a certain combination seemed to help us with a certain subgroup of patients. And then the biggest thing was the development of these injections of intravitreal medicine with this anti-VEGF. VEGF stands for vascular, which is blood vessel, endothelial, which is a type of vessel, growth factor. So we're trying to grow new blood vessels, and in our case, we're trying to kill those blood vessels. The drugs are listed there, and I'll tell you briefly about them. Um, the drugs, the first one that was developed was approved by the FDA in 2005. Um, I'm sure Dr. Singerman would want to tell you that we were the highest enrollers in the country for that study. So we had a lot to do with why that drug became available. It's called Macugen. Macugen worked great in that it was the best option we had for folks. It slowed down the progress of the disease, but it did not um, actually make people see any better. About 18 months later, we got a great, great new drug called Lucentis that came out. Lucentis had a better track record. It actually slowed down to the disease, but there was an improvement in some patients, like 40% of them actually gained vision back. That is still considered the gold standard of care. There's a drug called Avastin, and this is an interesting story because Lucentis was made from Avastin. The same drug company owns the rights to both drugs. Uh, Avastin is a chemotherapy agent. Uh, what they did was take a small amount of Avastin and turn it into Lucentis. Uh, the studies were done that showed it worked, but unfortunately the drug was very expensive. And some people couldn't afford the co-pays even on it. So some doctors, I believe in Florida, started to think, huh, I wonder if we could try giving an Avastin instead, and started what you call an off-label use of Avastin. And presently that's working quite well. The National Institute of Health did a study I think it concluded two, or two years ago that showed that Avastin and Lucentis work very similarly. Um, the drug company doesn't want you to know that, but they do work the same. They'd rather sell the Lucentis than the Avastin. Um, ILEA has been improved as of November of last year. It also has anti-VEGF. It stops those blood vessels in a little different fashion and is hopeful that perhaps um, it will last a little longer in the eye. 
current research is looking at a cocktail type philosophy. Um, back when the AIDS ep epidemic was, was bad, um, we, a lot of people didn't survive it. They found drugs along the way that helped. One drug doesn't work, but two might. Maybe three, maybe four. And that's the concept of a cocktail philosophy, and that's what we're looking at in now in research. Lucentis is good, but can we make it better? Wanted to talk a little bit about the intravitreal procedure. Some of you have had it done. It sounds horrible to think of someone putting a needle in your eye, but the needle is very, very small, smaller than an insulin um, needle. And we put it in a place of the eye that isn't particularly full of um, nerve endings, so it's not particularly uncomfortable. We put it way over here in the corner, and you can see I'm squishing my eye right now, and it doesn't hurt. If you did that on my cornea, I'd be screaming right now, but in the corners of the eye, you have very few nerve endings. We do use a, a Nova a cane like gel and some um, uh, fluid that numb that area, but you do feel the pressure of the injection when we push the needle in. Um, when when Macugen first came out, it was the first drug that they ever injected anywhere, and people were quite worried about having needles put in their eye. One of my favorite patients actually went on a whirlwind tour of the United States and went and met with groups of seniors to explain to them that it's nothing to be afraid of. Her definition of how uncomfortable it was is to grab the skin between your thumb and your first finger, squeeze it real tight, let go, and that's what it feels like. Um, I can also tell you that all the patients in the earlier studies that signed up for six months when we offered them three years said they'd keep coming. So the, the shots really are not that disturbing. Most of the eye, um, side effects are related to preparing the eye for the actual injection. And those common side effects are sometimes feeling like you've had a foreign body in your eye or a little piece of sand. Your eye might be red, and you might have those floaters in your vision. Um, these usually go away in a day or two. The foreign body sensation usually um, is helped when you keep your eye closed because every time you open your eye, the iodine is scratched the cornea a little bit, and you keep opening the scratch. So we ask people to kind of have an easy night of it. The redness is just like a bruise. The only difference is you don't have skin over your eye. When you, when you have a bruise, it's a blood collection covered by skin. It looks black and blue. In the eye, there's no skin there. So instead of black and blue, you see bright red. Looks a little scary, doesn't mean anything, and it's a great conversation starter with people. <laughs> so what is a clinical trial? Clinical trial is when they're trying to learn something about a new treatment modality that has yet to be approved by the FDA. Um, mostly they're sponsored by pharmaceutical companies who go out and um, get the, the researchers, seek them out and say, can you help me, I want to do a study of this drug. Or it can be clinicians themselves that get together and say, hey, you know, there's got to be a better way to do this. And they go through the National Institute of Health to do studies. Um, the example of that would be that Avastin Lucentis I told you about. Lucentis had been approved. We were using Avastin off-label. And the, the drug company certainly wasn't going to do a study to show that Avastin worked as well because they wanted us to buy the Lucentis. But a bunch of doctors got together, the National Institute of Health, and they did that, a head-to-head -head study, and found that Avastin worked as well. Um, clinical trials begin with a theory and the cause, and the treatments are developed accordingly. Um, so how does a clinical trial work? We first start with the idea in a lab. It switches then to animals. After that, the, the phases begin where humans use it. The phase one studies are the smallest ones. There's usually less than 50 people in the study. Everyone gets the drug. And the main purpose of the study is to see if there's any safety problems. Um, what they often do is put two or three people in a study, watch them, give them a treatment, watch them for two or three months, Make sure nothing bad happens, and when it doesn't, you get the next group in. And you keep going up and up and up to see when either you have side effects or when you can't um, put any higher concentration of drug into the patient's body. Studies usually last about six or nine months. If everything is successful, then they go on to what's called a phase two. A larger group are put into these studies, about 150. Again, they're looking at safety, but a little bit at efficacy as well. There's usually a couple doses and oftentimes a placebo. And then the studies usually are a couple years long. Um, a lot of patients are very leery of placebo studies. If, uh, placebo is when you get nothing. Um, you either get a fake shot without a needle. If it's a pill, they give you a pill that doesn't have any active ingredients in it. And a lot of people are leery. They think, why should I do this if I'm going to get nothing? Well, Dr. Singerman's best phrase to that is when you're sitting at home, you're doing nothing anyway. So what difference does it make? 
if you want to come to the office and visit us, we're kind of fun people. So it, the worst thing you're going to do if you get a placebo is you're going to be coming to see the doctor more than you would otherwise. The kind of cool thing about that is that we keep a good eye on the rest of your body. And I can actually tell you of about five people over the years that have been diagnosed with heart trouble, uh, stroke issues, and we found it before their normal doctor would. So it isn't a mechanism to learn about the drug, but also to learn a little bit about yourself as well. If everything goes well, then they put it to a phase three. This is usually 500 or more people around the country, sometimes internationally. And they usually pick the two doses that are the best and then, again, run it against a placebo. Placebos are only given when there's no other treatment options. So the wet macular degeneration studies, there's no way you could give a placebo in that because there's a treatment we know works. And it would be totally unethical to not give per some person Lucentis or Avastin. The dry studies are a different story. There is nothing else to offer. So we can give a placebo in that. The studies are longer, usually last a couple, two, three years. If everything goes well with that study, then it goes to the FDA to see if they will actually agree to um, approve the study. Um, just so you know, all during this whole phase one, all the way up, um, the FDA is always looking at your data to make sure what you're doing is safe and that it has merit. There's also the data safety monitoring boards. These are specialists in the field that look at the results as well and say, you know, this isn't good or this is unsafe or we have to fix something. Uh, lastly, there's an institutional review boards, and these are folks that protect your right as a human being. Back in the 40s and 50s, there was a lot of experimentation that went on with people without their knowledge. These investigational review boards look at every study, and they determine whether it's good enough to do or not. Um, if the data doesn't support that the drug works, everything stops. Conversely, if the data looks good, the FDA will then be able to approve the drug. So what are we doing at Retina Associates? As I said, we got lots of treatments for the wet disease, but we think that we can do better. Um, we have two studies with Alcon Pharmaceuticals. One is of an additional drug given um, with Lucentis, and the hope is that the two together will do a better job at stopping these growths of these vessels. Um, they're also looking at a different modality and how to treat it. Instead of a shot every time, delivering that in, uh, medicine into the eye a little differently. Um, there is also a study from Orr Pharmaceuticals, and this one's using an eye drop. You still get Lucentis, but you get an eye drop as well, and the hope is that if you get two, it'll make things slow down a bit, and perhaps you won't need to have as many injections, because oftentimes you get six to nine eight during a 12-month period. Um, and then lastly is Optotech, and this is a drug that um, uh, is going to help work with Lucentis to kill vessels from a totally different angle. And the pre early preliminary studies, which we did in our office, showed that not only did those blood vessels go away, but the area of damage got quite a bit smaller than they would if you just had Lucentis. So we're hopeful if the damage area is smaller, then the distortion area will also be smaller. Now, if any of you, by the way, are patients of ours that wonder why you haven't been offered any of these studies, there's very specific criteria, and the biggest one is that it has to be the first episode you have of wet macular degeneration. So if you've already had the disease and have been treated, even though you're still getting treated, unfortunately, they don't want that eye for the study. They're looking for naive patients, for patients that have never had treatment before to start to learn. As far as the dry treatment, um, we're very proud to be involved in some um, great studies. The first one is a, a monthly injections of a drug that's supposed to cut down on inflammation. A lot of scientists believe that the inflammatory process of our body that's very helpful normally kind of goes awry in the eye and starts damaging the back of the eye. Um, these are monthly injections and the study is an 18-month study. It's almost full at this point. Acucella is a new pharmaceutical company that is using an old idea that we were involved with years ago, and that is using an oral medication that you take before you go to bed at night. It's called a visual cycle modulator, and it does just that. It changes the way the visual cycle works in the body. The theory for this drug is um, that when our body uses vitamin A to C, and yes, your mother was right, carrots are helpful, vitamin A does work in the eye, these byproducts of vitamin A, instead of getting out of the body, get stuck in the eye and start backs like your sink backs up almost. So now you've got all these byproducts that are on top of each other and that are physically crowding out the part of the vacuola that works well. So their idea is change the way vitamin A is used and perhaps 
you won't have that damage. The best example of this is the old cars of the 60s and 70s were all V8 engines. You pressed your foot on the gas, the car took off, you got there real fast, but there was a fair amount of pollution. These are more like the V4 or the six-cylinder cars, where you push your foot on the gas, your car eventually takes you to where you want to go, but with less pollution. So that's the concept. Turn the eye from working quickly to a little bit slower so there's less pollution. Problem is there can be some side effects because the drug does, or the revision doesn't work as quickly as you would like. Um, we were involved in a study of a similar drug about five or six years ago that had some really good um, results. Um, unfortunately, the doctor that owned the rights to the drug wasn't a very good businessman and did not keep going on those phases as I described earlier. This Accusella company just bought the rights to that drug. So my guess is that they really feel that this concept is the way to go and if this drug doesn't work, perhaps another one will. And then we got Genentech. They're also working on an injection. We were involved in that study, uh, got great results, and apparently they're going to start a phase three. So that's the one with 500 patients or more in the country. And that should be starting early next year, we're hopeful. So what do you do if you're not treated? You'll always have your peripheral vision. Um, you never are in total darkness, which is kind of a, you know, if you have to find something good about having this disease, you're never in total darkness. There's vision that uh, you can use. It's not the most useful vision, but you can learn how to use it. And all of these folks over here, Deb, and all these folks have um, examples of how we can use what we have to our best of our ability. Um, an example of this is one of my patients that bought a huge TV because he couldn't see it anymore. And he bought this massive TV and he still couldn't see it because he couldn't see straight. He found if he sat sideways and looked at his kitchen door, he could read the crawl from CNN on the TV. But if you looked at the TV, he couldn't see it at all. So sometimes you have to do a little experiments. And the professionals you'll see here, doctors, people that help you real quickly. The Library of Congress has talking books which are phenomenal. Kim knows a lot about that for people that miss reading. And make the most of your vision. Check it with a grid. If you get this abnormal area for it gets worse, please call your doctor immediately. And lifestyle mod modulations. Anything that will help your heart work better um, will help circulation better. Wear those sunglasses, dietary supplements, green leafy vegetables, uh, fatty fish, those are things that we feel help and processed food probably is not the best. And that is it. For questions, we've got the lovely Lynn Rinaldi over here from Macula Vision Research Foundation and the other lovely Kim from Retina Associates of Cleveland. You, many of you may know her. Uh, and uh, raise your hand if you've got some questions for Diane and we'll, they'll come and bring the microphone to you so you can ask it. If we can get them on. <laughs> Uh-oh, where's Ray? Yeah. I'm a lab now. Okay, what we'll do is we'll repeat the question. We'll try that. We'll, we'll get them on for the next session. They were working earlier. Any questions? Okay, we'll find you. you here she comes. I feel like game show. What were the three clinical trials for macular degeneration? For, for the dry? For the dry. For the dry. Um, it's on our website, just so you know, www.retinas.doctors.com. We have a whole section that shows what we are recruiting for presently. One is um, by Novartis, and it's an injection of an anti-inflammatory type drug. The second is a pill, that oral uh, modulator from Accucella. And the third hasn't started yet, it finished, and now they're going to ramp up to start the next phase, and that is by Genentech, and it's also a, an injection. Okay, over here. The vitamins, A-Reds and A-Reds 2, I think it is, they contain an awful lot of minerals. Are these minerals good for the body that's trying to help the eye? Like, it's high in vitamin A, it's high in zinc, and there's another one that's high, and I can't think of it right now. But, you know, I'm for and against it. 
Right. I think Dr. Singerman probably is going to be able to speak to that better. I can tell you that they just finished a second air. It's of five more years, and I believe they've taken the vitamin A out. There were some issues with that. Um, so I believe that's been taken out, and I don't believe they have the fish oil in it, um, but there is lutein, and lutein is a precursor for vitamin A. Um, that's why I told you, make sure that you talk to your doc about it, because there are some things that, that can show, but they did look for side effects and for dangerous um, problems with that. And as I said, they got rid of the vitamin A, but I'm not sure about any of the other details, and Dr. Singerman can probably speak best to that. They are changing the formulation, though. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. you have one over there. One, we have time for one more, for Diane. What, what if you have wet macular and are taking the shots and you also have a cataract? Is it safe to have that cataract removed? Yeah, that decision is a decision you make with your retina doctor. Um, years ago, they thought that doing a cataract procedure during shots or while, while you're in the middle of that could possibly worsen the situation. I'm pretty sure that they found that that's not necessarily true. But from a safety standpoint, the best decision is to, to talk to the retina guy. Um, the cataract extraction is also when you have wet AMD, sometimes you don't get quite the vision that you want back from it. It can certainly brighten things up for you. But if the macular degeneration is the biggest problem, the cataract extraction, might not help you as much as you wish. But he'll make that decision with you. 